Hello, uh, very good afternoon to all of you who are here, students and faculty, and uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, Professor Minakshi. Uh, she doesn't need much introduction. She's the star of the faculty. She's working with students at uh, so. Uh, it, it's not me though, but still for the benefit of those who have not uh, read her profile and her research, I'm just introducing a bit. So Meenakshi Banerjee trained as a clinical psychologist uh, at NIMHENS. Uh, she completed two years of clinical training in the year 2015. When uh, she researched uh, for M. Philip was on adaptation and implementing group narrative therapy for adolescents in school settings. The doctoral research goes to study effective neuropsychology at the famous Cognitive Neuroscience Center of Nimhans. Her area of research, uh, the topic is uh, she tried and developed a cognitive control training program for uh, neurocognitive deficits in depression. And she also successfully conducted a randomized control uh, research study to see how effective the program is. So much more. Uh, she will discuss. I'm uh, so glad to uh, be here and listen to her. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Deepak, for that kind of introduction. So I think most of all of you I kind of know well, so that we can have a good discussion as I go along uh, introducing my research topic. Um, how I've tried to um, divide this is maybe I'll go in first introduce the topic, I'll introduce the methodology that we used, and then we'll take a break and maybe I can have some questions if, at that point. And then I'll go on to talk about the results and the discussion and implications of the study. Uh, it was a very long study. Uh, it was uh, five years, full five years. Um, of PhD, so there's a lot. I'll try and skim through the stuff that I feel like uh, is not very relevant uh, for a summary. So I will kind of skim through that. If you have any doubts from that, also we can discuss. I have removed primarily large part of the result chapter because it's very um, statistical, and I don't think at this point there's any point going into numbers. Um, but again, if there's any questions on that, we can talk about it. Um, so how I started this research uh, was that I primarily wanted to study uh, metacognition and its um, uh, what is the contribution of metacognition in higher order thinking and how important it is. Uh, the subject uh, that I wanted to take up was adolescence because my previous work was with adolescents in school setting. However, because of various other reasons in PhD that we are not aware of when we get into a PhD. I was not able to work with adolescents and hence eventually it was decided that I will work with um, patients who were diagnosed with major depressive disorder because that was one line of research that had begun to be spoken about uh, metacognitive and cognitive control aspects of depression, but they weren't studied in a lot of uh, detail, at least in Indian settings, we weren't really talking about it that much. Uh, whereas in some parts of the other countries, they had started to develop programs which work directly with the brain and depression as such was coming out to be also now called a brain disorder, right? Just like earlier schizophrenia was not thought of as a brain disorder, even depression wasn't really looked at as a primarily structural or functional difficulty with the brain. It was always understood as a mind disorder. So that's where I kind of came into this topic. So just to kind of little bit introduction. So major depressive disorder uh, is one of the most prevalent psychiatric disorders and is a uh, general prevalence in the um, uh, population is about 20%. It is a major public health problem and major cause for disability. Uh, it is recognized as the largest factor contributing to global disability by the World Health Organization. In India, the National Mental Health Survey in 2015 to 16 reveals that it's approximately one in 20 Indians suffer from depression. Of course, this my study was I did my study before COVID and post COVID, we all know that it's only gone up the disability and the prevalence. 
um, depressed mood and loss of interest are key features, uh, though other cognitive symptoms indicate the severity and characteristics of the episode. Uh, contribution to significant functional impairment and impact recovery. So even though in the primary symptoms, when we diagnose depression, we don't look at concentration and decision-making deficit. However, when we look at diagnosing severity, we do look at uh, some of the cognitive symptoms as it is in the ICD criteria. Okay. Um, Neurocognitive deficits are now considered central to depression. Deficits reported are mainly in cognitive control functions such as working memory, response inhibition, and mental flexibility, which are harbingers for cognitive biases and metacognitive deficits. I will explain this as I go along um, in the presentation. So what is cognitive control? Cognitive control primarily includes updating task, updating whatever um, we are thinking about, updating our knowledge. Um, switching, switching from one thought to another, being able to be flexible and inhibition. Inhibition is uh, being able to stop a prepotent response to something and being able to give a conscious response, which is not your readily available response. Right? Cognitive control and emotions. So cortical limbic pathways implicated in regulation of negative um, implicated in the regulation of negative mood. This has been studied multiple times and studied across a uh, couple of uh, decades. Cognitive control facilitates adaptive emotional regulation strategies. Uh, emotionally laden cues activate bottom-up indication for need for higher top-down control required for the situation. Primarily, that is to say that when we are, when there's a trigger in the environment which affects us emotionally, it requires us at the top-down functions, which is the emotional part of the brain, to be able to kind of activate the entire brain and somehow ask the brain to regulate itself. Uh, how does that happen? Primarily, as we know, from the executive function. So the top down goes to the executive function. The executive function then eventually decides how to handle that information. Right. So this is done through uh, efficient uh, attentional control, executive control, and appropriate interpretation of that particular triggering uh, information. Metacognition is the monitor which assists and uses its mechanism for complex tasks such as problem solving, strategy selection, and decision making. So when the trigger is not very clear, metacognition is what decides whether it requires uh, attention or not, right? Metacognition is the ability for us to zoom out and see what information requires how much attentional control, right? Do I want to engage with this information? Do I not want to engage with this information, right? Cognitive control is skill uh, to help support the focus and reflection needed to complete these metacognitive tasks, right? So once metacognition has decided that, hey, this information is really important, I require to allocate some resources here, then cognitive control comes in, which is, it is a lower order thing, but without that, you can't really do anything with the attentional control, right? So if your cognitive control is not working efficiently or the structures for cognitive control are not working efficiently, metacognition allocation wouldn't really help, right? So both of them have to work in tandem with each other. So what I'm trying to actually say after a long uh, literature review is that metacognition and cognitive control plays a crucial role in furthering uh, MDD episodes through poor emotional regulation Poor cognitive control furthers metacognition failures such as lack of cognitive confidence, cognitive self-consciousness, and higher felt need for control. These are all parts of metacognition, right? So me feeling that I'm not very good at remembering things is a part of my metacognition. It's part of me knowing that I'm not good at remembering things, right? Um, so all of that gets affected with a poor cognitive control. Metacognition is the supervisor which manages resource allocation. Suboptimal cognitive control leads to reduced resources to allocate, which further adds to compromise strategy selection for emotional regulation, such as rumination. Right? So when we are not being able to allocate strategies correctly, we know that there's something else that is more important that has to be done. We still ruminate on the things that aren't as important in the given current scenario or important enough for the goal that we have. Right? These deficits are trait markers and persist even after symptom reduction, right? So uh, again, the idea uh, is that even after reco episodic recovery, so we know that uh, the depression is an episodic disorder, right? It is not, unless it's dysthymia, it is not kind of going to continue forever. Uh, once diagnosed, generally four to six months is its natural recovery happens through uh, of an episode, even without um, any kind of... Uh, um, any kind of remediation as such, right? 
However, it has been understood that uh, the longer your episodes are and the more episodes you have, it kind of compounds, right? So the more likely you are to have an other episode, right? So there was a STAR project, which is a very large project. It worked with a lot of uh, uh, depression cases, which has proven this because it's a long-term project uh, that if depression episodes are not treated correctly, they continue to cause uh, episodes again and again, right? So it's a kind of declining disorder in that sense. All right, just quickly, I'll go over the review of literature. Um, of course, we looked at neuropsychological deficits in depression. So there was, a, uh, from 2000 to about 2015, there was a proliferation in studies which was looking at um, neuropsychological deficits in depression. So there are just so many of them. I've just marked out a few. Uh, the summary of most of these studies uh, is that uh, major depressive disorder shows significant difference from healthy controls on measures of attention, executive function tasks, such as working memory, response inhibition, um, set shifting, and mental flexibility. Uh, we also see that cognitive control uh, underlies rumination and vulnerability factors in depression. So cognitive control deficits uh, are more apparent in hot or emotional cognitions, not so much in neutral cognitions. Right? Uh, especially for MDD, basically. Uh, now, what are the cognitive deficits and how do they affect functioning? Because we know that uh, depression also causes difficulty in functioning of the person, right? The first person is not able to do the regular tasks they like to do. They're not able to, uh, there's uh, occupational and social decline, etc. So uh, we also know that uh, studies show that neurocognitive functions play an important role in functional recovery and large number of patients report residual cognitive symptom post recovery, which interfere with functioning, right? Primarily, it would show up in terms of, I feel fine, but I'm not able to go back to work. I'm not as efficient in reading. I used to read a lot of books, but now I'm not hardly able to read even two pages, etc. right? So that, that is the way in which like neurocognitive deficits show up post recovery as well, post symptomatic recovery as well. Uh, depression, rumination, and metacognition. So there were quite a few studies that have happened uh, in the last two decades uh, looking at these parameters together. Uh, not always uh, all three of them, but sometimes depression, rumination, or rumination, metacognition. Again, to summarize some of the basic key findings, uh, they highlight that depression is related to metacognitive deficits, which lead to poor strategy selection, poor emotional regulation, and higher rumination. These deficits have been linked to deficits in executive functions primarily. Uh, also, negatively biased depression results in both top-down and bottom-up dysfunction. Um, uh, executive functions play a crucial role in autobiographical memory retrieval and can cause prolonged self-referential rumination. Treating the disbalance of hyperactive amygdala activity and hypoactive frontal activity will help reduce depression symptoms. Now, why am I talking about autobiographical memory? Uh, it's quite crucial to talk about autobiographical memories here because when the limbic, when there is an information that goes to, like I said, if it's significant for us emotionally, we also kind of evaluate it through our autobiographical memories, right? We try and understand what does this mean to me? Oh, so I'm upset about something that this person said. Um, does that mean to me that this person is saying something bad or this person has said something in context, it has some other kind of meaning, it doesn't need to be uh, self-referential to me, right? So this check-in with autobiographical memory is also very important. Of course, that happens through primarily ventromedial prefrontal cortex or medial prefrontal cortex, which is also a part of the executive function system, right? Very close to the dorsolateral uh, frontal cortex, which is doing all the cognitive control. Right? So that's where the autobiographical memory comes in. And I have used elements of met uh, autobiographical memory very significantly in my study. That is a little bit like the USP of what, what separates my study from a lot of other studies that have looked at something similar. Right? So uh, mode induction is where I come in with autobiographical memory. Um, so just to kind of give an explanation, because a lot of you might not be familiar with what is uh, cognitive retraining. Cognitive retraining is primarily retraining the brain on certain features, right? For example, memory, attention, working memory, uh, mental flexibility. So it is being able to give your subject a lot of tasks which are difficult for them to do. So what we say is that the task should be adequately difficult for the brain to be able to improve. Right? If the task is very easy and the person can do it, it doesn't help. If the task is too tough and the person can't do it, that doesn't help. So you want levels of different kind of diff task difficulty so that the person keeps improving, reducing errors, right? And increasing the times they get something correct. 
right? That now increases neuroplasticity in the brain, increases uh, gray matter in that particular area. Primarily, we train the frontal area because we want the frontal area to be uh, more active. And what we are saying is that in depression, frontal areas are hyperactive and um, the limbic areas are hyperactive, right? So what we are trying to do is uh, we are saying that cold cognitive control task, that is without any emotions involved in those tasks, you're only going to be training the frontal areas, right? But you're not getting the advantage of reducing the hyperactivity in the limbic areas. Now, what do you do to reduce hyperactivity in the limbic areas? You introduce mood induction, right? So you try and induce a kind of trigger for your subject. Once they're triggered, now they have to keep that limbic uh, trigger, like whatever that you have triggered, they have to keep it aside and focus on the task. Right. So in a sense, that's how you're also involving the limbic, you know, uh, cognitive control task. As I said, this might be a little kind of difficult to catch. Please, uh, once you take a break, please ask questions. Right. So mode induction and healthy control has shown reduced encoding or more repetition for learning. So it has been shown that even if you induce a mode, it works in the same way in the brain. Right. For example, when we see a a uh, sad movie and we start crying right or we get very upset and we're distracted for a while because we're kind of still zoned out into that emotion right so that is typically what a mode induction does in the healthy brain it activates the limbic area right uh, impaired performance on planning under positive mood compared to neutral mood uh, low intensity positive and negative effect associated with enhanced working memory uh, while high intensity positive and negative affect was associated with impaired working memory uh, induced mode recruit the same neural substrate and have comparable impact on cognition and psychophysiology as the mood states uh, in mood disorders. There is an established link between subjective affective rating and brain activation. Uh, effective mood induction techniques may be useful uh, in successfully engaging the hot networks during the task. Right? And this is why I used mood induction in my uh, study, because I wanted to engage the hot networks as well, not just in the cold networks. In fact, a lot of uh, research studies that I reviewed, which have done neurocognitive training for depression, they found that even though um, the subjects did improve on the uh, task, they, however, weren't able to translate this into really actually be getting better on functional things, right? Because they were still not really being able to reduce the hyperactivity of the limbic networks. Um, <clears throat> all right, so has, has uh, cognitive retraining used mood induction before I did? Yes, there have been studies where uh, they've already used this. So emotional brainstorming task uh, in with schizophrenia has been used. Um, emotional NBAC task has been used. Affective set, um, shift task has been used before. Uh, they do not directly evoke an emotional reaction or have a hint of emotional material, which may or may not necessarily evoke the involvement of limbic region. So I did try this in my um, uh, studies. So first, I mean, since I was developing a task, I was working with clients already. And intermediately, I would give them some of these tasks to just get a kind of feedback from them. I was also getting feedback from my colleagues who I'll do these tasks on. But we found that just having like a picture in the task, which was emotional, wasn't really emotionally invoking anything as such, right? So what we needed was really to engage the hot systems completely. So that is why we uh, primarily developed uh, videos um, where there were enactments of certain stories. Again, we also did find that even with those videos, uh, etc., we were not able to really get them to really feel something very sad. So eventually what we did was an autobiographical task. We showed them videos. We asked them to think about something similar in their life and write that down. And that seemed to be evoking a um, kind of did, did the trick for the mood induction. How do we understand whether mood induction has happened or not? We take a pre and post rating from the subject uh, whether there's been an induction. Right, so just to talk a little bit about effectiveness of cognitive control training in various psychiatric disorders. Uh, we have seen that across psychiatric disorders, um, cognitive retraining has shown moderate to high improvement, such as uh, schizophrenia, substance use disorders, anxiety. Cognitive retraining has been done in India. Primarily, large no number of studies have been done in Nimhans, but there are some studies that have been done outside Nimhans as well. Um, it has been used in traumatic brain injury, schizophrenia, healthy normals, elderly, MCI situations, and mild Alzheimer's disorders. Uh, ADS, that is alcohol uh, use disorder, uh, social cognition in schizophrenia, and depression. Uh, so just kind of listing out all of the studies that have used uh, cognitive retraining. 
or specifically use cognitive control retraining. They are known by different names. They have different kind of tasks involved, but all of them have shown uh, moderate to high improvements, right? Moderate to large affect size, uh, changes on cognitions, depressive symptoms, and general functioning. Few studies which have worked on hot cognition, no studies have looked at CR's effect on metacognition. So that was another, like just like mood induction, uh, metacognition was an extra element that my study kind of studied, which other studies hadn't. Now, when I was designing my study in NIMHANS, you have to keep presenting your protocol. So initially you present your pro protocol once and uh, after your pilot, you present your protocol once. So I got a lot of feedback saying that if you're going to be doing 18 sessions of this training, of course, you're going to be meeting your clients for 18 times, right? And that in itself can have an improvement in the client. So how are you going to account for that? You must, you need to have a control situation where you're also meeting clients for 18 sessions and trying to do something that is relatively equivalent, right? And it's not working on the brain network, but it's relatively equivalent for you to show that your brain training has actually affected the, um, uh, the clients and not just uh, you're meeting them, right? So we did add an inter uh, kind of control arm as we call it, it's, uh, with where we did something called a behavioral activation. Behavioral activation is the first line of treatment for depression. It in itself is a valid treatment and has shown high effect sizes uh, for improvement, right? Um, however, when we look at uh, behavioral activation's effect on the brain, we know that it primarily affects the brain through the dopamine system. So the idea of behavioral activation is that you get people to start doing tasks that they were previously interested in and that align with their interests so that uh, there is motivation that builds up and then there is reinforcement after doing the task, right? So it's obviously working on the similar frontal networks. Um, only four studies have been done which are looking at behavioral activation um, uh, training in depression and its effect on the brain. Studies show improvement in the prefrontal areas through better cognitive control, reward pathways, uh, loss anticipation and other uh, others' perspective on self. So these were found to be the main areas of improvement that behavioral activation causes. Right, so what is the rationale for my study? Depression is associated with increased elaboration of negative information, difficulty in disengaging from negative material and deficits in cognitive control when processing negative information. From neuropsychological perspective, the negative schemas are a result of faulty effective information processing bias caused by cognitive control deficit and poor metacognitive strategy selection. The conventional and intervention programs, including cognitive behavior therapy, metacognitive therapy, emotional regulation therapy, focused on training strategies to reduce dysfunctional negative cognitions, while a cognitive remediational program, particularly CCT, attempts to improve the functioning of the brain regions, neural correlation, correlates mediating these cognitive functions, which are presumed to be suboptimal in depression. So what we're essentially saying, if you look at this, is that instead of train, training the software that is involved in these kind of processes, we are going to try and train the hardware itself, right? And the kind of, uh, the software will update itself when the hardware is working correctly. Effective emotional uh, emotion regulation requires high levels of cognitive control. The ability to exert cognitive control in the face of affectively arousing emotional distraction might therefore play an important role in recovery from these negative aspects. So when you're feeling low, if you're able to kind of work on a cognitive heavy task and bring yourself to the frontal brain, that should be able to help you come out of it. Right? That's what we're trying to say. Uh, and be able to use better strategies such as reappraisal. The aim of the study is to develop cognitive retraining program to augment the cognitive control elements which are known to improve metacognitive processes with possible elevation of depressive symptoms. Right? So I'm going to stop here. This is just in the introduction. I'll quickly maybe go over the methodology so that you know how we did it and then we can take some questions. All right, so aim of the study is to modify and develop cognitive control training program with affective component of cognitive control by addition of mood induction and emotional components to suit patients with depression. The objectives are to examine effectiveness of cognitive control training in improving symptoms of depression and anxiety in patients with depression, to examine the effectiveness of cognitive control training in improving neuropsychological functions in patients with depression, to examine the effectiveness of cognitive control training in improving metacognition, emotional regulation, and rumination in patients with depression, and to examine the effectiveness of cognitive control training and quality of life outcomes in patients with depression. So are there any functional changes is what you want to know. Uh, who are the completers? 80% uh, of the whole, uh, so we had 18 sessions, even if they did uh, 15 sessions, we uh, considered them completers for the program. The design was a randomized control design with baseline post and follow-up assessments. 
the intervention group received cognitive control training and the control group received behavioral activation training. Right? The sample was 60 patients that were recruited, um, 13 each group, that is cognitive control uh, intervention and behavioral activation with diagnosis of major depressive disorder, uh, meeting uh, predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria. This random allocation was done by a blind data, like I was not the one allocating them. My supervisor primarily did uh, uh, envelopes and check picking through which we um, did a random allocation. The sample was drawn from outpatient department of psychiatry in NIMHANS. 30 healthy controls from community were taken for a one-time assessment on neuropsychological test for the purpose of normative data. Okay, so we also had a third arm, which was healthy controls to only compare the end point of data. Right? So inclusion, diagnosis of major depressive disorder, 18 to 50 years, because we know that the brain is relatively stable during this time, comprehension of written and spoken English and Hindi, right-handedness, normal and uh, normal or corrected vision or hearing, pharmacologically stable at least one month, because we didn't want this to be uh, an effect of the uh, change in medication. So the only uh, people we recruited were people who were pharm pharmacologically stable. If there was a change in medication required, we had to remove them from the study. Exclusion. Uh, because left-handedness has shown to have certain slightly different characteristics, uh, at least on neuropsychological uh, measures. So neuropsychological measures, generally when we compare data, we always compare from right-handed data in healthy normals. So we just didn't want that conclusion at all. History suggested of neurological, uh, neurosurgical conditions and uh, history of head injury was exclusion. Patients with diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder, uh, severe depression with psychotic symptoms, schizophrenia, delusional disorder, current psychoactive substance abuse or dependence was uh, excluded except nicotine use. Uh, patients who have undergone any structured uh, psychological intervention in the past six months are excluded. Patients who have undergone any neurocognitive intervention or neuropsychological assessments in the past six months were included, excluded. Patients who have received ECT in the last six months were excluded. History suggestive of mental retardation based on clinical assessment were excluded. Criteria for healthy control, uh, 18 to 50 years, right-handed with written and spoken Hindi English, uh, adequate corrected auditory vision and sensory motor functions, exclusion history suggestive of subnormal cognitive function, uh, specific learning deficits or mental retardation, other psychiatric conditions which were ruled out by many screen, any form of psychological intervention, any other neurological, neurosurgical conditions were excluded. Just giving the, I'm not going to read this out, but primarily we use these definitions, um, operational definitions, mainly informed by the um, tests that we were doing, right? That's what we generally do when you're doing the study. You use the definitions that the test uh, that you're using is using, right? So rumination, emotional regulation, etc. Tools for study. So we developed our own social demographic data sheet, which looked at basic uh, demographic information, age, onset diagnosis, course of illness, medical history, family history, comorbid conditions, etc. Uh, the tools, uh, the rest of the tools were divided into five categories. One was the clinical measures, uh, other was the neuropsychological measures, and the cognitive measures and uh, the quality of life measures. Right? So this is a little bit of the gist of what we did. So for clinical outcomes, we looked at clinical global index, which is called CGI. The CGI was again um, done by a blind rater. So before I recruited someone for the study, a blind rater, which had minimum five years of experience working with uh, psychiatric condition and diagnostic psychiatric conditions, uh, did the blind rating starting of the study. And towards the end, they did the blind rating ending of the study to look at the improvement in the condition. Right? Why is this done? So that they don't know which arm the uh, person belongs to, whether they're doing the behavioral activation arm or are they doing the cognitive control arm, assuming that the researcher might have a bias. Um, Bex depression inventory, which is a self-rated inventory, Bex anxiety inventory. Um, then we did a neuro, uh, couple of neuropsychological tests, uh, primarily from these batteries of tests. BKF is Dennis Kaplan's executive function system. Uh, Waze is uh, Weschler's adult uh, intelligence scale and uh, Ways is a uh, memory scale, right? These are the ones that we primarily use. We use some of the subtests from all of these scales. For cognitive measures, we looked at metacognition questionnaire, which is a short version, 30 um, item version. We looked at cognitive emotional regulation questionnaire. We looked at uh, ruminative response scale, which is a part of the response style questionnaire. And finally, we looked at quality of life and enjoyment scale. 
just briefly to explain what all we use we used uh, spatial uh, in the neuropsychological test we use spatial span digit span primarily for a uh, visual and verbal working memory we used trail making test which primarily uh, looks at the set shifting ability we looked at the design fluency test which looks at the mental flexibility ability color word interference test which looks at response inhibition controlled oral world association test which looks at verbal uh, fluency annual name test which looks at category fluency symbol search which looks at processing speed matrix reasoning test looks at logical reasoning and finally there is auditory verbal learning and the ostrich uh, complex figure test which look at visual and verbal learning and memory right so we had quite a complex and full uh, battery um, but we had chosen the test um we did the statistics uh, statistical analysis with spss software version 20.0 assumed normalities were tested we looked at primarily t test man with me tests uh, and anova uh, wherever the criteria for normal uh, distribution was not met then we looked at paired t tests and we got some sign down tests right we also used some correlations i'll not be talking about that too much because that was a side thing of course we had all the ethical consideration the uh, ethics committee of nimhans had given approval prior to starting the study active control group was added because uh, also it was objected that it's not ethical to not give the other arm any um, any intervention participants were given the option to review uh, withdraw from the study at any point care was taken not to limit treatment option available to the patient and that's why they continued on pharmacological medication participants were informed that there will be no monetary incentive for participation in this research access to the intervention program was made available in cognitive um, in control group at a later point of time if they chose to um, attend it and there were a few patients who did decide to attend it looking at the procedure how did we go about it so in the phase 1 i looked at and tried to understand the deficits from a client point of view because uh um, since i didn't have the experience of going through a major depressive disorder i felt that i needed to understand what are these kind of deficits and do patients actually understand these deficits because instead of a psychotherapy if you're giving them a cognitive control training are they going to be able to understand what we are trying to do right with them are we just giving them some task and they're like we've come here for depression but we're just giving us these tasks so i wanted to know better what their understanding of their deficits are then we wanted to also Right. so this is a little bit of the literature review that i did to understand these problems so what is emotion focused regulation what is problem focused regulation where does it come from uh, what is the kind of corrective feedback that the brain gives um, what is the met, uh, metacognitive uh, strategy that is used which part of the brain that is related to etc right so this is one part then i wanted to understand the themes that they come up with right so if someone's depressed what are the kind of themes if you're saying that there's um rumination that happens in depressed patients what are the kind of things that are, they are ruminating about what are they really thinking about so i wanted to understand those themes also to develop eventually my emotional material right the mood induction material i wanted these themes um so for that we took 11 patients from phase 1 group discussions were done with other phd scholars who had worked with depressive patients we looked at things like loss guilt loneliness shame incompetency betrayal etc we found that more or less when we did a qualitative understanding these are the themes that primarily came up right then we generated emotional content emotional content was created by uh, a lot of us phd scholars got together and we did skits uh, so and we recorded videos of these skits uh where there were mood induction videos right and eventually development of paradigm for mood induction which was done through using previously used paradigms uh, for mood induction right as i said we realized that just showing them a video did not induce a sad mood as such unless they were able to relate that video to their own lives right once they were able to relate it to their own lives and write about it that helped in inducing a proper mood state right so scenarios are validated and um, appropriated uh and the valence of those scenarios because we wanted multiple levels of mood induction so this was done by three experts which had been working in this field for 10 years of eventually six uh, patients and six healthy controls were rated uh, all of these uh, mood induction um, pictures and videos uh, and their ratings and valence on arousal um, they felt that there was low uh, reliability we added uh, dimensions of what a bag difficult to recall and then we did the re ratings and we found that they were able to induce mood in these clients we also worked on cognitive control task and we finally had nine tasks distributed over these domains which is attention working memory response inhibition mental flexibility set shifting and uh, autobiographical memory sorting
integration of task with emotional content so once we were at the task for ready we wanted to add the emotional content to the task so as to change the levels of the task so the idea is that the task in itself can increase in difficulty if you're doing a working memory task and the task is to primarily remember certain number of um a uh, certain number of numbers and then to work on them and change those numbers by adding say to uh, adding another number which is difficult uh, that is one way of um, introducing levels which is a very cognitive and cold uh, way of introducing the difficulty uh, but by introducing difficult different levels of emotions we can also add the hot layer of the uh, brain functions and making it tougher and tougher depending on how much mood induction we are doing there right? so pictorial stimulus was used with various uh, emotional flavors and levels pictures were taken by the researcher for the purpose of the study internet filtered permission commercial use were uh, the ones that were used validated by three experts for cultural appropriateness and appropriateness under the heading sad happy and neutral and we use modified welton statements welton statements are pretty popular uh, for being able to introduce and use mood so these are studies which have been done multiple studies which have been done by welton statements so you start by a relatively neutral line and you go on further and further going into a mood induction by using uh, uh, mood inducing statements eventually i also felt that clients were not able to understand all of this because it was very like cognitively difficult and i felt like edu psychoeducation was important before starting cognitive control training because a lot of clients wouldn't know how to generalize what they were doing in the sessions at home right so we also wanted to tell them that how you're going to use this at home is that you're going to use it in your regular day everyday activities you're going to try and use certain strategies um, when you're doing when you're doing about your task when you're meeting people when you're talking to people try and use these strategies and see whether you're improving because we also wanted to add that metacognitive feedback element metacognitive feedback element is primarily your confidence that you can engage in something right so if you're not being able to use any of this uh, in your real life the real life generalizability of these tasks becomes less so we added one session of psychoeducation at the starting of the um, cognitive control training and then in the ninth session when we are introducing the emotional elements um right this is what this was primarily done to relate the symptom to the task uh, relate everyday problems to the components of the training and improve motivation so in behavioral activation training we primarily use the uh, behavioral activation for depression a clinician's guide by martel uh dinijan and herman um we adapted that into 18 session framework the main phases involved psychoeducation treatment rationale daily monitoring life areas values activity monitoring and planning contracts planning for upcoming days and review assignments right so primarily i'm just going to quit the pilot study part and go directly to the main phase so main phase involved baseline pre intervention assessment intervention phase um, which was 18 sessions post intervention assessment follow up assessment after one month and then follow up assessment after three months again i'll just quickly go over the consort diagram so information regarding patient status diagnostic uh, impression of was obtained from medical records whoever met the criteria uh, were taken into the study inform information was provided to them uh, about the study then screened using a clinical interview mini screen bdi uh, handedness inventory and whoever met the inclusion exclusion criteria again whoever met the criteria were taken in then they were given the written informed consent uh, if they said no to the written informed consent we had to exclude them if they said yes we took them up into the final uh, randomization then they were randomized either into the treatment or ccp group uh, or the active control group baseline intervention was done after that intervention phase pharmacological treatment as advised by the treating psychiatrist for both groups and 18 sessions of ccp or behavioral activation post intervention assessment after 18 sessions follow up assessment after one month follow up assessment after three months right so total patients that i screened uh, initially was 678 patients um, there were a lot of other difficulties like language criteria severe anxiety symptoms that the client wanted to work on associated psychotic symptoms because of which we had to remove them from the study approximately 90 said they're not going to stay in bangalore because a lot of people in nimhans come from different cities approximately 80 said they're not able to come two to three times a week which was the requirement for my study 90 met inclusion and exclusion criteria 69 approved uh, provided written consent and out of that nine patient dropped out of the study due to difficulty in commuting uh, found the assessments very difficult or felt better immediately after the psychoeducation session 
Uh, 60 patients were allotted randomly into CCD and BA group. A blind reader using online randomized number generator was used. Rest of the things I've already discussed. Um, so 18 patients completed um, all the sessions for CCD group, 20 patients completed sessions for the behavioral activation group, 18 completed post assessment, uh, all the 20 completed post assessments here as well, and eventually 17 participants completed the follow up assessments. After one month, there was another little bit of dropout uh, by the three months. Generally, in NIMHANS, when patients feel better, they either go back uh, or they resume work, right? So they find it difficult to keep coming back. All right, I'll stop here. I think picking up a lot of time. Anything, any questions so far? I don't know if the students are being able to follow. I hope we are all being able to follow. Yeah. So, hmm. um, one, because nicotine, um, I mean, nicotine is one rel relevantly, rel relatively prevalent. Uh, so it was difficult to kind of um, exclude everyone. And already, as you saw, there was a lot of difficulty. Like I started with 678 and I came down to like just 60, right? So generally we have, we find that screening is difficult. Uh, plus we felt that uh, nicotine doesn't have such a strong um, uh, neurocognitive change element as such. So that's why most studies we do include nicotine. Yeah, so why I'm saying hardware is because when we work in other um, therapies, right, we're talking, we're also doing something similar, right? So if you talk about cognitive behavior therapy, the idea is to change strategy, look at the other side, take perspective, right? So that is also in a sense doing reappraisal work, right? A lot of studies, are, a lot of other therapies are also doing reappraisal work. But why we are saying that our study primarily focuses on the hardware, because we are trying to change the functional network connections, right, in the brain. Uh, of course, it's hard to say that in 18 sessions, you will be able to make a structural change. But the idea of neuroplasticity is that, that you're directly working on the networks of the brain instead of in directly working on the networks of the brain through therapies. So I still could not understand what makes you say it's a hardware change. So hardware change, for example, what we are working primarily on is the network connectivity between co um, cortical limbic pathways, what we say, right? Limbic is the emotional area of the brain, cortical or the PFC is the frontal area of the brain. So we are directly working on these pathways. I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, default mode network, salience network, and the central executive networks, which are the three main networks also implicated in depression, which are, which are what we are trying to work on. So we are working on the connection in between these networks. What we are saying is that therapies also work on these networks in a way. Uh, however, they indirectly work on these networks. So that's why we are calling these networks the hardware, and we're calling the therapy software in that sense. Because essentially, they're also doing the same thing, right? You're trying to recruit, you're trying to reduce the hyperactivity of limbic system by either validating the client or by saying that, hey, uh, try and look at it from a different perspective, etc. You're doing the same thing, but you're not directly attacking the systems or you're not saying that the networks are the main issue. Someone who's had, yeah, yeah, that's why I think the way I presented because I had multiple things on that slide, uh, it wasn't very clear. So we did have three. Um, so initially when we uh, made these, we had three of my consultants who actually looked at these senior consultants in NIMHANS uh, and they appropriated them for valence and arousal. Uh, but eventually we used them with six healthy control clients and six patients with depression, the same ones that I had used for the first phase of the study. So they also eventually did validate them. Yeah. 
yeah <laughs> almost dropped out in the second year of <laughs> the any other questions before i move on Something that wasn't there in literature review already, and I assumed that this. Yeah, so that's what we used a particular uh, mood induction technique that had been used earlier. So primarily, what we do is we do we make them write down what they are thinking, and then we do a pre and post. So. how are you feeling now so we do take a mood rating from them so to be able to say that the mood has been induced yeah that is why we added the element of uh, autobiographical memory because we felt without that we couldn't see a mood induction really happening hi yeah so we this was a primarily she's yeah so this was primarily a neuropsychological study so neuropsychology is uh, measures in the sense um, for example um, if you talk about set shifting so it will be a category switch so give me uh, names of uh, fruits and give me names of furniture and then keep switching between the two for example that would be a switch task right how quickly can you generate how many switches right so um, these are behavioral measures in that sense neuropsychological measures are behavioral measures uh, one of my co-guides who was from psychiatry dr sensil reddy he was doing an fmri study already i did not have funding for fmri study at that point of time so some of my patients did go through those fmri pre post but that data we still haven't sat down and kind of done that data um the problem was that is 18 sessions enough to show an fmri change is the main issue right so we weren't really sure that's why we didn't really ask for funding and go ahead because it would have become a longer study one and second we weren't sure what we would be able to show after 18 sessions so, yeah, so sorry but i like this mark yeah because there was already an fmri study going on so some of the participation uh, participants did go through the fmri study uh, F, through the fmri pre and post primarily frontal and uh, limbic activation yeah Yeah, that is definitely something we proposed eventually that this study needs to be replicated with an fMRI pre and post uh, or an EEG pre and post, etc., to be able to kind of validate some amount of what we are seeing about the network. Uh, but again, like I said, that primarily all of these are neuropsychological measures, and they are understood to be tapping that right. So that has already been validated and reliability. Yeah, hopefully that's what. that's why the, the measures that we are taken are measures that have been done before they have taken from validated batteries so when you say there is a lot of motion therapy yeah and you know that 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 you know that
Yeah, cognitive or emotional regulation question. It's a self measure rather than a proper task. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, now that you say that, definitely a task would be more appropriate. But I think that time, because we had already used like my guide from my um, uh, from the behavioral unit, had already used cognitive emotional regulation, and it had shown to have very good validity uh, and reliability. And we had seen a lot of um, the other studies that had taken that up, so we continued to use it. Also, we didn't want a lot of assessments because uh, we were recruiting depressed patients, right? And this is just when they've come in with a depression diagnosis. So we didn't want to bombard them. Already I was doing a lot of assessment. Uh, so sometimes they would say that like, I'm feeling like a headache and this, that. So we didn't want to. Yeah, we um, so uh, we kept the assessment to about a 45 minute one hour thing. But even then some of them with severe uh, uh, depression did require breaks. We allowed those breaks. I mean, we couldn't really. Since it's a clinical population, we have to go along with being kind of, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll just move ahead unless there's another question. Maybe you can take it at the end and we can speak about it later. I'll quickly go over the results and the implications of the study. Um, so just to kind of give a brief about what was the social demographic characteristic, uh, primarily because I was taking up only Hindi and English speaking clients in Bangalore. So I got most clients who were uh, in the kind of ad young adult uh, population. So the mean age of the, my population was 26 um, with uh, uh, 26 males, th uh, 34 females, uh, 23 of them were married, 37 of them were single and two of them were divorced or separated. Right. Just to kind of say that both the groups were kind of similar in all of the other social demographic characteristics as well. Both the groups were comparable in all of the clinical characteristics as well with similar kind of comorbidities and family histories. Right? To be able to see that none of it had more genetic or less genetic um, uh, features. Uh, just to say complete a sample, I've removed all the uh, tables here. No significant difference in terms of social demographic and clinical variables for the complete samples as well. Group set baseline, no significant difference in terms of clinical and neuropsychological variables in the two groups. I just want to quickly run over them. Post intervention, just to kind of talk about summary of results. Again, a lot of data here, so I've kind of I'm just going to summarize all uh, my um, results. Most outcome variables and neuropsychological measures showed significant change from pre to post in both groups, except uh, on the metacognitive questionnaire. Positive uh, thoughts about worry did not change in the cognitive emotional regulation. Positive refocusing did not show a significant change and other blame also did not show. Um, other blame and positive refocusing is a kind of cognitive regulation strategy. These did not really show any change. Other, all of the other strategies like reappraisal, etc. showed a change. Uh, in cognitive word uh, interference test, word reading condition, sorry, that's I don't know why I've said it in reading. Word reading condition didn't so, show a change, but uh, word fluency and word switching condition did show a change. Significant group differences in outcome variables were seen on rumination response, uh, working memory, um, spatial span backwards and digit span backward, uh, mental flexibility, category switch, design fluency, switch task, uh, visual learning and memory task. Significant improvements were seen pre to post in cognitive control training group and in CRQ, which is cognitive emotional regulation, refocus on planning and positive reappraisal, which were not seen in behavioral activation group. So these were specific improvements in the CCT groups. Significant differences were between uh, behavioral activation uh, post course and healthy control groups were seen on mental flexibility, verbal fluency, um, color word interference test, design fluency, working memory, uh, and uh, uh, immediate and delayed response on both the verbal and uh, non-verbal uh, memory tasks, right? So what I'm trying to say is that 
uh, after uh, even after an episodic uh, improvement in the behavioral activation group these were still sub performing in the depression group which only got behavioral activation training and did not get the cognitive control training right implicating that cognitive control training is improving all the other areas which sure behavioral activation group is also showing improvement on but some of these deficits continue to remain in those groups which didn't do the cognitive control training right so what does this mean uh, i primarily how i divided my uh, discussion is changes in outcome measures following uh, cognitive control intervention comparison of current results with previous studies changes in outcome measures in control group which is uh, behavioral activation what could be the reasons for that analysis of dropout a comparison of clinical sample with matched healthy controls on neuropsychological tests proposed mechanism of therapeutic effects of the intervention so what we are trying to do is trying to imagine what might have happened and how this change might have happened implications of the pre present study critical evaluation of the study and suggestions for future research and finally researchers own if reflections and observations of the study which is what i want to kind of study further ahead from my thesis right so first hypothesis uh, was the study there will be no difference in the outcome measures before and after cognitive control that that stands rejected second hypothesis that there will be no significant difference between ccd group and behavioral activation group on pre post assessment uh, stands partially rejected cognitive control effects on neuro uh, psychological measures significantly significant improvement in the executive areas tested in the cognitive control group training on cognitive control tasks uh, generalized to the test of some construct on neuro transfer effects so what we say uh, in terms of uh, how the transferability happens in um, uh, cognitive remediation is that first can the client improve on the same task second can the client improve on an other task which measure, measures the same thing so if i'm doing working memory some other task which is tapping working memory can they do better on that and finally in the real life scenarios for example reading a book and remembering what you've read like just three pages uh, before that particular page um, that's a kind of transfer into your real life like that is the best kind of transfer right that's kind of generalizability into real world Okay, so working memory deficits, cornerstones of other cognitive and affect regulation deficits in depression. So visual learning and memory also showed large overall affect size, and this is something that was quite surprising, which we were not expecting. Uh, due to the cascading improvement in cognitive control, learning and memory requires sustained attention on the material, strategic encoding, uh, rehearsal, and recall of the material, uh, dependent on effective cognitive control. Functional neuroimaging of autobiographical memory reveal have found consistent activation of the right prefrontal and superior parietal cortex. These areas are associated with non-verbal memory. So why we are saying that non-verbal memory improved much more in CCT? I tried to look up the research post. Uh, I found these results, and we found that. Um, so think about this, right? Whenever we think about something, we think about it in. Uh, my first thoughts are visual, right? So if I tell you. uh the first day think about the first day you guys came to gju right the first things that you're going to think about are your visual impressions of what was going on right so what we're saying is autobiographical memories primarily live or exist in um the right brain or through visual memories right uh and that is one of the main kind of uh, effects that we saw and we also know that in depression there's something called uh memory specificity right that uh, when you're in low mood you kind of recall more of what causes your low mood so you, that also creates a problematic loop especially if your cognitive control networks are not working well you keep recalling like bad stuff that has happened to you so if you're able to switch from this and you're able to think in fact this is uh, a lot of studies have been done and now there is an entire um kind of uh area um which works primarily with memory specificity training so what they are saying is that because people um uh, who are prone to depression or major depressive disorders are not able to use happy memories to recover from bad moods that is why they have prolonged bad moods right so in a sense we are also looking at kind of that uh, aspect of memory specificity um ccd's effect on metacognition yeah i think more or less i have already summarized so i'll just quickly say like the last few lines from each of these so effects of the ccd uh, involved response inhibition ability to stop automatic negative thoughts at will mental flexibility ability to switch from one thought to another and working memory which is the ability to update the belief system and so instead of going through all of this i'll just talk about so all of these are studies which have kind of uh, previously spoken about my findings and i've tried to 
check um, how do we understand my results uh, in line with previous studies. So I'm just going to quickly show you guys some diagrams that we made in terms of what we felt were the proposed mechanisms. So in a healthy neural response of, to an affective cue, so example, there is an affective cue. Um, it goes into the affective system of the brain. Um, then what we call the reflexive system. Reflexive system is, okay, I understand how to respond to this, and we give a normal emotional response, right? However, if there is a kind of doubt about how to process this information, uh, it goes into the reflective system, right? The reflective system is the kind of longer route to kind of understanding what's going on with me, right? Which kind of works on the cognitive control network. So this through the frontal uh, networks and the medial prefrontal networks, which is my understanding of self, right? Who am I uh, a person? Uh, what kind of person am I? How do I generally respond to emotional information? All of that will interact with each other with my autobiographical memory. And eventually I give an emotionally regulated response to the trigger, which could be either emotion focused or solution focused, depending on how I've chosen to kind of understand this information. This is what we call the salience network, right? This network where emotion, like we are thinking about the fact that, hey, this is important information. It's emotionally significant to me. Can I think about this properly? This is executive networks, which is execute central executive network, the one which kind of controls this process um, through the prefrontal areas. And then we have the default mode network, which is autobiographical memory and the medial prefrontal, right? So all of these networks combine to give us a healthy emotional response, right? Which is appropriate for that situation. Now in a depression prone neural system, there's external cue, there's affective system, there's depressed emotion. Um, if this goes to the reflective system, if we feel like, okay, no, I want to think more about this, it will override the cognitive control network because it's working suboptimally. It doesn't really, it goes directly to the medial prefrontal cortex. And that's why there's a lot of personalizing that happens in depressive uh, symptoms, right? Every information becomes more relevant personally to the person. Uh, that causes more rumination because it's not going through the cognitive control network and hence causes the loop of depressed uh, depressed emotional network, which is why uh, most of the studies have spoken about increased default mode network activity, right? There's just constantly working on their own self or uh, what's going on with me, etc. That's why people who are prone to depression are also very inward looking, right? They find it hard to come out of that um, network. All right, just maintenance of symptoms, uh, pretty simple, quickly go over this spoken a little bit about mechanisms of change. How are we basically doing this change? We are reducing this override of the cognitive control network, reducing the rumination that is caused by being able to, for them to be able to switch autobiographical memory. So to be able to update your sense of what's going on through changing autobiographical memory, hence strengthening the connection between the salience network and the executive uh, network. And just a little bit of why we are talking about the right brain so much in depression, because there are a lot of studies which have talk, spoken about the significance of the right brain and hence the visual and learning memory deficits more pronounced. Right. Um, just last bit of what I like to say. So, um, what are the implications of the study? Uh, they are ta uh, targeted a precise, well-established cognitive risk factor linked with maladaptive emotional regulation and risk of depression. Uh, conventional interventions such as pharmacological antidepressants are unable to alleviate the risk uh, of this particular element. Improvement in the areas of emotional regulations which are not changed uh, through traditional behavior techniques and improvement with CCPR, uh, mostly for participants, participants who show deficits at baseline. We did find that very mild depressive episodes, etc., would not show a large change, at least at that point of time. Also, because of the kind of clients that I got for the study, we were like primarily most of them had only first episode depression. Um, hence, again, um, the kind of affect size wasn't very large for most of the changes, right? Because if this is your first episode of depression, we are not seeing very large um, uh, deficits in neurocognitive functions to begin with. Uh, right. Uh, further, the implications, the functions of CCP is to enhance the top-down regulation of prefrontal cortex by strengthening the executive functions, build better metacognitive strategies to tolerate distraction, develop better emotional regulation, eventually add to metacognitive self-knowledge. Hence, this format of CCP may be effective in other disorders such as obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Any disorder where there is an override of the frontal systems.
Right. Some of my suggestions for future is, uh, is, uh, research is longer follow up. Basically, we want to see whether there is a long time, whether we are actually being able to avoid another episode by improving these uh, networks. Right. So we want to do a long, longer follow up, which is kind of hard in limb hands. Uh, future research can assess patients under mild, moderate, severe, or multiple episodes versus first episode category. The interventions can be simplified to be made more time and labor if, uh, effective because this took a lot of sitting with the clients, working with the clients uh, for the in, um, investigator. Different age groups such as children, adolescents with MDD or elderly with MDD can be assessed. Other disorders with similar psychopathology like anxiety or um, CC deficits due to organic causes can also be looked at. Right. Some of my reflections, I'm not going to go through them now, but these were very important to me when I was doing the study. I also saw that there were a lot of deficits in humor, empathy and theory of mind, all of which are eventually connected to the prefrontal and the uh, medial prefrontal networks um, in my clients, which also showed improvement in the CCP. So, uh, for example, the clients would come and say that I'm not able to understand uh, a lot of the jokes that are happening around me or like my nephew wants to come and talk to me about something but i'm just not interested in talking um so a lot of this kind of going into the default mode network also causes these deficits which we see in everyday life uh, which are helped by cognitive training a uh, neuropsychological perspective of self in depressive patients so again there's a very problematic sense of self which happens in our uh, depressive patients which again is related to autobiographical memory difficulty with switching autobiographical memory updating autobiographical memory uh, also suitability of patients with depression so Hermans at all have spoken about subtypes of depression subtypes which have primarily um, uh, attention deficits subtypes which have primarily um, learning deficits etc so it could also be seen that different subtypes may benefit differently Lastly, therapeutic alliance and cognitive remediation has been spoken about very briefly, but we know this about all kinds of therapies that therapeutic alliance is the basis of your improvement with your clients. I felt that in cognitive remediation as well, if I was not able to have a good therapeutic alliance with the client, neither of the therapies were really effective, right? So it's really important when you do a study like cognitive remediation, where it is a little bit depersonalized to have a good alliance alongside. So that's about it from my end. Thank you. So, I like your approach, it's primarily a, a top down approach, right? So, what I'm wondering is, is this efficacious in the long term, or do you really need to modify the output of those limit structures themselves? Which, of course, that's what a lot of the medications are targeted at. Yeah. So, you know, there is sort of a trope, there is some evidence to support that it's not therapy by itself, it's not medication, it's really the combination. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. That is, is this a long-term solution or do you really need to modify the structures themselves? Uh, if you say modify the structures, like what would that, what would be the mechanism so of modifying first, structures? So if you say the depression is affiliated with vagal activation or cingular cortex, lots of you know, the circuit is involved with that. Yeah. So the, the top-down approach, you say we can regulate perhaps to give it or at least control the output of that circuit okay. through this top-down structure, right, prefrontal. The bottom-up approach would say, independent of whatever prefrontal is doing, you need to be able to regulate the output of that circuit. Yeah. So again, a lot of the medication is designed specifically to reduce the activation of that circuit. Okay. So again, I'm not saying this isn't a good approach. I'm just wondering if it's a long-term solution for depression in this case or any other type yeah from um what i understood uh, there before we did our study we did see a lot of studied studies had already happened in the west which were looking at cognitive control training but they were looking at primarily training the cold systems or the cold network which is just the top-down networks 
and not at all involved involving the bottom up networks that is one major reason that we did look at uh, mood induction i mean it was very painful to make those mood induction videos and then you know validate that get the autobiographical memory involved so all of that was primarily done to actually not make it an only top down kind of approach we did want to have bottom up and then being able to kind of reduce the bottom up effect right so we also training them on the inhibition aspect that hey now you're triggered you have this in your mind you just thought about something which is horrible for you but you have to come back to the task right in fact we introduced this after the eighth session and the ninth session onwards we introduced emotional material so they had already trained on all of these tasks now they had to like kind of work you know extra and that's what uh, in, i have removed that some of the charts and graphs we saw that something like passive their um, uh, errors went up a lot in the ninth session right so every client uh, uh errors went up in the ninth session because they are like doing this extra burden of not thinking about what we just spoke about in the mood induction and focusing on the task so in a sense we have tried to involve that element um i'm i'm not i'm i'm i agree with you that whether we've completely taken care of the limbic system i'm not sure well i thought the mood induction i think that's very very good well maybe this is a small question but why are you calling it mood mm right Mood is a background state. Emotion is a response to something. You're presenting a video and then trying to evoke a emotional response. Yeah. So again, I'm just curious why why do you call it mood? I mean, we primarily started with looking at mood induction studies. So, Welton study is the most popular study for mood induction, where they take you through like series of um, sentences. So slowly, they kind of try and induce the mood. So I think that's primarily where I came from. I'm not sure if I looked at the nomenclature in that sense. Then, I'm sorry to monopolize, but to go back to the question of so when you validated those, those were based on the evaluation of fellow students. Yeah, so validated them with three uh, senior consultants in my department. So three senior clinical so psychologists. Put out there publicly. I mean, that sounds like a really valuable resource. Yeah. Has that been made available for other psychology departments? My guide and I currently have the access to it, but yeah, so we. that data yeah. the method for mood induction i already published like how we went about doing the method but yeah we haven't released the uh, videos uh, yet so but we can you're right it did take a lot of effort so anything I need to log out as well because I you can do that. <laughs> Please go ahead. As long as I'm logged out, you'll yeah. be paranoid about this nowadays. No, I think if you use this double login thing, I'm I started using.